There was a period of about three years spanning uh, the end of 2015 through uh, most of 2018 where not a single federal grant I wrote got funded. So uh, it was kind of at a point where I thought I kind of had a little bit of the funding situation sort of figured out. Like I, I had served on review panels, I kind of knew how things went. Um, but, it, uh, and, and it, but it really made me reflective of how to treat rejection. And I think maybe some of the things that I thought about during that period might be helpful um, to up and coming academics. So this video is intended primarily for grad students, um, undergrads applying to grad schools, uh, postdocs, and assistant professors. The first thing I want to say is that academia isn't that bad in terms of rejection rates. So the typical rate of rejection of grants that might be the most competitive milieu in which we kind of uh, we play as academics is maybe 90%, maybe 10% success rate, um, you know, give or take. Uh, for a paper to even a fairly competitive journal in your field, the rejection rate might be 30 to 70%. Uh, conference abstracts, depending on the, f the field that you're in and the particular conference, might be something like 20%. So I know that some of the uh, symposia that I've organized have had rejection rates imposed from the top of maybe like 15 to 20% for posters and of course higher than that for talks. Um, it's going to be a lot higher than that, the rejection rate that is, in a field for which the conference paper actually uh, is the paper and some fields of electrical engineering um, might fall into this category. But if we compare these rejection rates, even the high rejection rates of like 90% for grants to the rejection rates or implicit rejection rates of people like writers and musicians and athletes, um, these, are, uh, these are professions in which people sometimes take their entire career, much of their career, to get any kind of, of, uh, of mainstream platform for their work. So in all, uh, academia, you, you know, it isn't that bad. You kind of just have to play the long game and, and accept that maybe you might submit uh, far more um, pieces of work, then you will actually get, uh, get accepted. Some rejection is actually a sign that you're doing things uh, right. And what do I mean uh, by that? Well, it's true that you don't get 100% of the things that you don't try for. So you can only really get what you tried it to get. But think about it this way. If you apply to, uh, if you get everything that you apply to, then that really tells you that you're not taking enough risk because there might be something outside the edge of what you are applying to uh, and, and that, that you're getting successfully that you might be able to get if you only applied to it. Now, if you apply to these, these things outside the range, of course, you're gonna get uh, rejected sometimes, but that's really a sign that you're, you're being uh, risky enough. So if you, don't have a, if you don't get rejected, it definitely means that you're not taking enough risk. Uh, for example, a hotel uh, doesn't shoot for a 100% occupancy rate because if they achieve a 100% occupancy rate, it means that they're leaving money on the table. It means that they're not charging high enough uh, of, a, of a room rate. So maybe they might shoot for 95%. Also, it's possible to learn from rejection. I think we, especially in cases where you get detailed feedback. So if you can apply to things that, uh, that give you feedback or try to obtain feedback, it can actually turn rejection into a good thing. Rejection rates go up as you progress throughout your career. So the competition really gets more intense as you move further up the ladder. So as, a, uh, as an undergraduate applying to grad school, you uh, often students will kind of self-select and usually they have a few options by the end of that, uh, that process. They've applied to a range of, of programs and, uh, and usually there's a choice to be made. Um, as you go up uh, to, the, to, to applying to a postdoc, uh, you might send many more uh, emails and, and get many non-responses and rejections. 
Um, and then applying for grants and, and submitting papers to competitive journals, that's when the rejection rates as a, uh, as a uh, professional scientist really go up. In the case of applying to grad schools, some PhD programs actually require that you reach out to your prospective advisor ahead of time. And for others, uh, for other programs, it's actually a good idea to do this unless the application expressly discourages you from doing it. So they'll tell you, please, you know, don't reach out, just let, our, let us make our decision. A non-response from one of these faculty members is not equivalent to a rejection, so by all means apply anyway. Also, a response in which the person says, uh, I don't have a position available or I don't currently have the funding to take a graduate student or postdoc, this isn't actually a rejection, so you shouldn't consider this uh, a rejection. It could actually reflect the fact that that person was rejected from their most recent grant proposal. Uh, it's important, I think, in these circumstances to take the rejector uh, at their word because that's all the information you have and frankly, you need to get on uh, with your life. In the case of postdoc positions, it's totally idiosyncratic. You just have to reach out to faculty members that you know, like seminar speakers. That's actually how I got my uh, postdoc position. So my postdoc advisor was a seminar speaker at my PhD institution, and I met with her during one of her uh, office hours. Actually, she didn't have office hours. I kind of forced my way uh, through uh, onto the schedule of the seminar speaker, and uh, sometimes you just kind of have to do that. Also, ask your current PI for their recommendations. They might also also have, um, have uh, friends in the field that, uh, or, or people who respect their opinion uh, to which they might be able to, to whom they might be able to send a letter of recommendation before you actually reach out. In the case of postdocs, most postdoc rejections aren't actually rejections. So it's only really a rejection, in my opinion, if they flew you out for an interview and they selected another candidate for the same position. Um, and even so, it's not, it, it's not really a rejection so much as the other candidate who is also well qualified might have just fit the position a little bit better. As academics, we've all had the experience of getting, reject, getting papers rejected. And the reason that getting your paper rejected sucks is because you always get the referee report and you get in gory detail why the reviewer made the, the recommendation to reject your paper to the editor. Sometimes the criticism is unfair. Sometimes the criticism reflects a misreading of your work or that the reviewer didn't read or recall stuff that you actually had in the paper. Uh, but oftentimes these types of criticisms are rationalizations ex post facto for a bigger issue, a bigger problem that the reviewer actually had with the work. Um, and there is some, some deeper reason, like they perceived uh, the authors, or they perceived you as having aimed too high in terms of the journal relative to the perceived impact of the work. Um, it could be that the key aspects of, of the work have, in their opinion, already been demonstrated uh, in other papers. Uh, and also possibly that they felt that the importance uh, of your data in supporting the conclusions was oversold. Um, a lot of times rejections come down to tone and that a reviewer really didn't appreciate um, you know, how uh, the, the conclusions weren't quite supported by, uh, by the experiments. Even if you still disagree with the criticism, uh, this, know that this is actually a preview. You can regard this as a preview of, as to how others will react to your paper, and it's actually better to get negativity from three people as opposed to 10,000 people uh, who might be your potential readers. Referee reports are 
best regarded or maybe most healthily regarded as free consulting, even though they're pretty rough takes. It's not like a like a consulting report. It's really sometimes it's got spelling errors in it and it really annoys you, um, but it really is free consulting. So consider the fact that if a PI in a STEM field has five to 10 graduate students, it might take half a million dollars a year in external funding to run that lab. And if you kind of do the arithmetic, that means that if they're spending an hour to review your paper, that's about 200 to $300 that they've foregone in grant funding that they could have been applying to. And you can consider that to be kind of like their consulting rate. So, a really good detailed referee report that took a, an expert several hours to write might be worth like $2,000 in cash and uh, might mean much more than that to your, uh, your career and the quality of your scholarship. And that's definitely what I've found in the cases where my papers have been uh, ripped to shreds, especially if it's a field that we're uh, trying to enter from the outside, and uh, you know, ultimately, we don't want to expose our, uh, our 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 ignorance to the field. And sometimes, when it when something is really on the line, and someone gives your work a careful reading, you can kind of internalize it and improve your own work in ways that's not really possible without all of the emotional investment and reaction. When applying to faculty positions, uh, the rejection rate is much, much, much greater than for even the most competitive grants and papers. So this is a completely different story altogether. Each advertised position probably has 200 to 300 applications. They might shortlist 10 people and maybe Skype interview 10 people and then maybe fly five people out to the on-site interview and then maybe select one. So for example, I applied to 28 faculty positions. I figured I actually fit the description of what they were looking for in maybe, maybe 18 of those positions and maybe 10 others were kind of just out there. Um, and I had seven interviews and six rejections, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then my seventh response was an offer. Uh, although if people from UCSD are listening, I should say that if this were my only offer, I still would have come here. Okay. Uh, these uh, rejections from faculty positions are personally the hardest rejections to swallow because number one, it comes at a time in your career when you're not accustomed to facing such long odds. I mean, if you're a successful academic and undergraduate, and uh, what does that mean? It means you got, you know, A's on your exam. Uh, it's also tough, number two, for the fact that you looked at all of your interviewers in the face, you had some long and sometimes personal conversations with them, and then they rejected you anyway. Uh, and it's not, it's best actually not to regard these rejections as pure rejections. It's really that someone else in the pool who was also a great scientist uh, or academic uh, was a better fit for the position, they might have had a strong advocate on the committee, or they were favored by the chair or the dean, or maybe their research uh, program fit a particular strategy of the uh, university. Grants. So grants are, this is how I kind of started uh, this, uh, this video, this is why I'm, why I'm recording it. Uh, getting grants rejected uh, feels especially personal because as the PI, you may feel that the reviewers are taking food out of your students' mouths and clothes off their back. Uh, and also it's likely, the grant that you wrote is likely an idea which you spent maybe a whole month's worth of Saturdays or uncommitted time writing, refining, and getting excited about. And you might feel that the grant decision, the decision that the, that the reviewers make on the grant, is more a validation of your core research ability and topic than it actually is. Uh, I would say that at this point in my career, I'm much less upset about grant rejections than I used to be, in part because I expect it. So most competitive grants have rejection rates of maybe 90%. 
And while uh, I and every other breathing human being on the planet uh, considers themselves to be at least a little bit better than the median, uh, I can at least rationalize the numbers so that's easier for me to do now than it used to be. Also, I firmly believe that grants provide a nice self-limiting mechanism to uh, academic research. Um, for example, if I got everything I applied to in a given year, I would honestly be overwhelmed with responsibilities, reporting requirements, um, have too many students to be a good mentor, and so forth. So uh, some amount of rejection, actually a, a good a good a large amount of rejection can actually in part be a good thing. Um, it's a lot like how baby sea turtles uh, don't all make it to the ocean to end on a dark note. So that's it. Hopefully I've said something that was useful to you. Hit the subscribe button, share on Twitter, uh, and leave comments for future topics. All right, take care.